Welcome to the Midweek Market Update, where I do a technical analysis and give you my thoughts on SPY the Qs and IWM. After that, we will be taking a brief tour through our core list of companies. And if you stick with me towards the end of the video, I've got four additional trade ideas to share with you. So definitely stay tuned for that. This is the last time you're going to hear from me about t-shirts. We've got two smalls, sold out of mediums, five larges, one XL, and four double XLs. If you're interested and we've got your size, you can order at the first link down below in the description or just go straight to tradebrigade.co forward slash t-shirt. Let's get down to business in the S&P 500 with our sector as we always do, who was leading, who was losing, and where was the weight today. The XLB for the materials sector led the pack up 2.84%, whereas down at the bottom of the barrel, we see the XLU for utilities only up 0.44%, so a little bit of a laggard from that perspective. But notice that everything in this column is green, and that's as measured from the prior day's close. From today's open, we actually did have a uh, even worse laggard. That would have been two notches above here, down 0.21% as measured from today's open. That's the XLP consumer staples, right? right? Both of these, though, are D for defensive, so it does not strike me as the end of the world to see these at the bottom of the list in terms of distribution as we had a CPI gap up and a little bit of follow through to the upside. Of course, many more thoughts on the CPI as we move towards the TNX in today's lineup, but nonetheless, the distribution of sectors does not strike me as concerning. The heavier weighted sectors, where were they? The XLK, the tech sector, the heaviest of them all, up 2.73% on the day's session. The XLF for financials, second heaviest weighted sector that we're watching, up 2.2%. Then the XLV, technically speaking, second heaviest weight by market cap, third in our lineup, up 1.09% on the day's session. Let's quickly flip through some of these charts and see how the trends are continuing to unfold from a structural perspective. The XLB needs to fall into the bullish category because we've got an inverted head and shoulders, break and retest on the neckline. It's held, and now we're certainly higher. Notice also there is no gap fill activity on today's session. That strikes me as a failure from the sellers. Buyers remain strong here. And if we look left, there's thin structure that we can retrace through fairly easily. Now do keep in mind that this is a lightweight sector. So it's not going to save the day if the XLK is falling off of a cliff, the XLF is falling off of a cliff, or the XLV is falling off of a cliff. If this is rallying through this thin structure and the other sectors aren't cooperating, this won't save us. On the flip side of that coin, though, right, if those sectors are really rallying hard and this does decide to pull back, it's not going to be the end of the world. Next up, we've got the XLY, a heavier weighted sector, certainly. So we're going to spend a little bit more time here and dive into trend analysis. Certainly on the weekly time frame, there's your double bottom, right? The neckline is here. What does that mean? It means if we do see a pullback, right, an aggressive pullback into the remainder of the week, as long as we're above 157 in the grand scheme of things, it's not the end of the world in the XLY. Now, on a shorter time frame sort of analysis in terms of what might happen Thursday, Friday. Look at what's gone on here. So we certainly did pull back and fill some of the gap, not all of it. So partial gap fill. And then what happened, right? We rallied into the close to close up towards the highs of the day's session. Also, if we think about this as a balance area, we're right back up towards the top of the balance area. It strikes me as, again, a failure from the sellers. There was no acceptance on the gap close. We didn't even fill the gap all the way. And then the buyers were able to close it back up towards the highs of the day's session. To me, it strikes me as a fairly bullish implication uh, that the sellers are just virtually non-existent here. Now, I'm not saying that means we get a massive breakout and continuation into the remainder of the week, but if we start to close daily bars up above 170, it opens the door to this kind of level up around 176, prior breakdown level from here, and the daily 200 SMA. Obviously, that's bullish pressure for your S&P 500. The only time I would shift tone in the XLY to being more bearish is underneath 157, as we've outlined based on a failure of the weekly double bottom neckline. Until that happens, you've got to be at least neutral to slightly bullish in your XLY, which is a heavyweighted component of the S&P 500. Communications is up next. What's going on in the comm sector? Really loving the activity that happened here on today's session. Reason being is we're firmly above 57. And look at where we closed. Again, very little gap fill activity. So failure from the sellers, right? And instead, we've closed now above this double top-ish area around 58.18. To me, it strikes me as a good, good sign of strength from the buyer. So this, of course, is bullish pressure for your S&P 500. On a relative basis, the S&P is trading like somewhere up here. So there's still a lot of room to sort of travel here if this is quote unquote going to catch up with the marketplace. Now, why do I even bring that up? Well, if your XLK sort of needs a breather, if your XLF needs a breather, uh, if the XLV is just going to continue to go sideways, 
this might be the sector that sort of carries the S&P and at least keeps it neutral. Um, if those sectors are just relaxing and the XLC is rallying, of course, that's bullish pressure for the marketplace. And if the other heavyweighted sectors are going sideways, again, your S&P is probably not going lower, right? So that's why I bring this up. If this is going to, again, quote unquote, catch up, that's a good sign for your marketplace. I would only be bearish on the XLC now if we move underneath 57 with acceptance. Notice that this can pull back fill the gap, technically be a higher low on the daily time frame, and then we can rally back higher. So again, only under 57 would I shift my stance on the XLC, and so far, so good based on today's implications. Next up is the XLK, heaviest weighted sector of them all, perhaps the most important to spend some more time analyzing, just like the XLY. We have a little bit of gap fill activity, not nearly as much, so partial gap fill, failure from the sellers to quote unquote, do their job, close the gap, right? There's virtually zero structure in there. Why were they not stronger? Why did they not do their job? Well, obviously they're weak. And what about the close? The close is even better than what we had in the XLY, right? Technically we closed green, but more importantly, outside of the prior balance highs, from right around in here. That strikes me as a bullish implication. Now we are running into a little bit of overhead resistance from this prior triple top that we were being mindful of for the upcoming week. And if we were to get a daily bar that closes above, the next target overhead is 152 roughly, and the 200 SMA, which of course strikes me as good bullish pressure for your S&P 500. Even if this were to pull back, let's go ahead and talk about the pullback scenario, right? We're getting bearish for a day trade only. Let me be explicit about that one more time. Day trade only if we sort of break down underneath the low to close the gap. Now, when we close the gap, my first thought then would be, can we get a gap fill reversal for a move back higher, which would then preserve, of course, your daily uptrend, right? You have a clear possibility for a higher low off of that 144.80. So in the grand scheme of things, no reason to be bearish in the XLK. For a day trade, maybe just to close the gap, maybe you can take a scalp on the Qs, maybe you can take uh, you know, one of our tech companies right short on the breakdown of the XLK low there from today's session. But overall, uh, as long as we're kind of at this point in time, I would say as long as we're above 142.14, Hard to be anything other than bullish in the grand scheme of things here. The reason I picked 142.14 uh, is because it's also the prior top end of this balance from right around in here. So in the grand scheme of things, could this turn into a bull flag like this? Absolutely is what I'm getting at. Uh, of course, today's session, as we just walk through the psychology here with the failure from the sellers, the close at the highs does strike me as bullish pressure for the S&P 500 into the remainder of the week. XLF, another important heavyweighted sector. So we are going to have to spend a little bit of time on it. I, I know, I know. Um, um, but anyways, look at where we're at, right at the bottom end of this prior uh, descending triangle, really, and balance area, and we stalled there. We have a big gap underneath us, which, again, failed to fill. So to me, sellers do strike me as uh, being weak. Uh, I'm not sure that I would be a new money long up here, especially on the heels of a gap up. Instead, I'd love to see either consolidation or even a little bit of a pullback. Partial gap fill, produce a higher low on the daily time frame, and then a reattempt here. Yeah, that's where you're looking for higher, back up towards that 3550. As of right now, I think that this one could use a little bit of cooling off. And remember that scenario that we just outlined in the XLC. If that unfolds, again, your S&P 500 is probably just going to go sideways, right? So not the end of the world here in the XLF. Of course, on the intraday, it's slight bearish pressure as we move into the gap, but the structure here remains intact on the bull trend, with higher lows clearly being uh, a possibility around this 3370. 75, right? So XLF bullish. Next up, XLI industrials, what's going on here? Breakout of the flag, 7% of our S&P 500. We're not going to spend too, too much time. These shorts, if they initiated on the look above and fail or just the gap higher on the first place on Monday, they're all underwater now. So to me, those people will either continue to be squeezed out or we will just go sideways here. I'm not really seeing the case for any bearish activity in the XLI, or at least I would not be willing to go short on the XLI or industrials overall, unless we breached 94.51, which strikes me as being a little bit of a stretch into the remainder of the week. Could it be a possibility? Yeah, anything's always a possibility. Uh, but to me, many more bullish implications as opposed to bearish. Next up, real estate. Obviously, with the CPI, this moved higher, right? We'll talk much more about CPI, the rate uh, and impacts based on you know what we learned about inflation today. But nonetheless, uh, just to give you a little foreshadowing, of course, CPI came in way better than expected, right? Inflation has sort of quote unquote peaked just based on the statistics, uh, the data, the numbers that came in, right? Which means that the Fed may not have to be aggressive with their rate hikes going forward, meaning that the 30-year mortgage can relax a little bit. Real estate prices like a lower rate. Obviously, lower rates means you can charge a higher price as the monthly rate is lower. The mortgage payment is lower. Not to get on too much of a tangent, but that's why this is higher. It 
is a lightweight sector. It is technically D for defensive as well, but the underlying reasons for why it's rallying makes sense to me. So it doesn't strike me as a red flag for the marketplace. Next up, we've got the XLV for the healthcare sector. What's going on in this one? Still going sideways in this range here. And ultimately, we're still inside the container bar as well, that large uh, hammer-esque type candle that we've been discussing for quite some time. Nonetheless, we've got a close back up towards the top on a small look above and fail uh, on the slight downward pressure we saw early on in the session. But nonetheless, uh, to me, it's just neutral, right? You can't be bearish in this unless we break down underneath 130.50. Uh, and uh, for the breakout, I would be more bullish on the break of 133.50. So as of right now, just neutral in this overall area. And remember that theory we discussed with the XLC, if the XLC pulls its weight and at least everything else is just going sideways, this stays in range here, I imagine that the S&P 500 holds up just fine, right? So that's what we've got in the XLV healthcare. Consumer staples is up next. We've got a break of the resistance trend line of this sort of pennant, if you will, on today's session. We did produce a hammer candle. So the long is over the high to quote unquote, fill up the triangle into these highs here. Slight bullish pressure for the marketplace. It is D for defensive. So if it does make that move, is it leading the charge to the upside? Absolutely not. It's just moving back up towards the top of its range highs. So that strikes me as fine. Not a red flag here in the XLP. Only getting bearish on this one if we get firm price acceptance with big daily bar closes underneath 74.56. So neutral to bullish in consumer staples. Again, everything that we've seen so far is kind of falling into the bull category. Can there be some pullback for gap fills? Yes. But if we fill those gaps in reverse, as we've seen, structure remains intact to the upside. Energy sector is up next. What's going on here? Playing nicely inside of this range. It is not aggressively leading the pack to the upside. It does not strike me as a red flag. Lightweight sector, defensive sector, Perfect. No complaints about this one. Moving on. Next up, we've got utilities. What's going on in the utility sector? This one, a little bit more of a red flag, right? If I just do something like this, it's a tiny red flag. It's not something like this massive red flag where we're like, oh no, the market's going to crash because of this. Ultimately, yeah, we don't want to see it leading the charge up towards these all-time highs. It would be nice for this to just play sideways in here and let the, uh, let the heavyweight growth-oriented sectors ultimately lead the marketplace. But again, small red flag currently, not a big red flag. Keep an eye on it. Uh, what we want to avoid essentially is a look that would mirror something that we had in here, right? Just absolutely incredible uh, rip your face off type rally. We want to avoid that, right? And as of right now, you can see it's just stair stepping, crawling to the upside, which is why it's a small red flag. Next up, we've got our ratio grid for the sectors. What's going on here? If you don't know about this chart, you can set it up by watching the tutorial in the uh, top. Whew. The tutorial in the top right-hand corner. There we go. That was a tongue twister. Uh, what do we have in the top four? Of course, these are risk on sectors. You can see that the XLK looks fantastic. Good distance between it and the 50 SMA. That's the gold line. Same thing in the XLY. So on the left side of the top four, we're all good. On the right side, eh, leave some room to be desired, certainly. The XLV rolling over a little bit. This needs to get out of that balance range we just saw on the daily and preferably to the upside, obviously, right? That would, of course, get this closer to the gold line, which would be more of a decent look for the XLV. Currently, I would just be more neutral. Remember that this was leading the charge really, really aggressively through here and slightly off the screen from what we had in here. So it's done its job. It's pulled its weight for quite a long while, and uh, now it's taken a little bit of a breather. So can it get back in gear is the question here again. Watch that daily balance area. The XLF, Look at the look at what's essentially unfolded throughout the course of the week, right? Really impressive move off the lows. It's trying to get back into gear. So two out of four with one being a little bit more neutral as opposed to outright bearish, I would say risk on is closer to being on than being completely off based on the look in the top four. In the bottom four, we have our risk off sectors and notice how that these are signaling risk off is for all intents and purposes off. XLP rolling over here. That's a good sign for risk off being off. Same thing in the energy sector, sideways underneath a 50 SMA strikes me as a good look. And we saw that on the chart as well, right? Real estate just going sideways up here. Ultimately, it's not trending aggressively higher, like the look we have in the XLK, which is a good sign. And then the XLU utilities eh, could be better, right? Could be underneath that sideways 50 SMA, but ultimately it's not like it's taking off aggressively with a similar look to the XLK. So overall risk off does appear to be off and risk on is on the brink of being back on. And that of course is a bullish sign for our S&P 500. Let's get on over to the TNX now and talk a little bit about CPI and rates and all of that good stuff. I've got some unconventional stuff uh, to bring up on the, uh, this is not a stream, the video today, but the CPI. What was going on with CPI? This of course is the consumer price index and this measures inflation. The month over month, I believe that, oh, wrong tab, here we go. This is month over month. So month over month CPI inflation actually was flat. Month over month, we had no 
uh, sort of inflation. Now, you can make all sorts of arguments that, yeah, it's still in force or whatever, but the data says zero, okay? And the market cares about the data. It doesn't care about your opinion on, you know, oh, you know, uh, I've still got to pay X for X. It's like, no, no, no. If, if you think that way, then it's going to be a tough time in the market. So overall, flat inflation, better than the forecast. That's a reason to rally right there. Have we seen peak inflation? Maybe this would certainly be an indication that we are ticking lower as opposed to higher. The next one, which I sort of previewed by accident here, is the year over year. So YOY year over year. Notice how that through this entire section right here, all of these months, the read has been getting more and more and more aggressive. I know I just did that backwards, but you get the gist, right? As we've been going higher through the months, we've been getting more aggressive reads. Finally, it ticks lower and it's better than the forecasted estimate. All of the reasons were there for a rally. Ultimately, what does this mean for the marketplace? Well, if we take a look at the FedWatch tool, look at what's uh, happened here. So the current rate is 225 to 250. And the target rate, based on what the market is pricing in, is now you know, dramatically shifted. So at first, this column was way bigger. Um, I forget what the exact breakdown was from a percentage standpoint, but now the target rate is 50 basis points away based on this range, right? So it's a range here and it's a range here. To get to this target rate, it would only take 50 basis point rate hike. So is the Fed going to give us a 50 basis point rate hike in September? It seems likely just based on what this chart is telling us right here. It seems likely based on if we go back on over to the TNX and you know feel a little bit more comfortable on the screen, right? Uh, it seems likely that as we've been discussing for like the past two or three weeks now, that the bond market got it right. They priced it in that, yeah, peak inflation is in the rearview mirror. Things are going to be fine and dandy going forward. Remember that we've discussed that ultimately the ideal path forward from the Fed is two 50 basis point rate hikes and then one 25 basis point rate hike. So for the next meeting, if we do get the 50 basis instead of the 75, I imagine that that's kind of on par with the market's expectation. Now that we've seen this data come out, keep this in mind. If in September we get 50 basis points as a rate hike, don't expect the market to do anything crazy. This is what's currently being priced in. If we get 75, that's a little bit of a shocker. I would expect a negative reaction from that type of move. And obviously a 25 would be like, oh goodness, that's way, way less uh, aggressive than we thought. Maybe the market will have a positive response. So anyways, that's what I've got for you in the TNX. You guys did seem to uh, appreciate the breakdown there with CPI and the Fed, the prior video that we did it. So hopefully that was useful. Let me know in the comments if that uh, was good or we should avoid uh, stepping into the fundamental realm uh, going forward. So anyways, I have fun doing that. Next up, we've got the VIX. <clears throat> what's going on in the VIX volatility index. Look at this thing of beauty <clears throat> underneath 2050. Remember that we said for the market to quote unquote have bottomed or the likely way that we will see the market bottom is a move under 2050. It is no longer going to be a sort of big capitulation bottom up around the 40 handle and we're back under 2050. So the market's in a more comfortable position, especially now that CPI has been released. The path forward looks pretty, um, you know, tame, I should say. Uh, the market's, you know, it's fine with that. Absolutely fine with that. Um, so VIX coming back down under 2050 does strike me as a bullish implication, big aggressive red body bar on the day session. It's not like it was a whimpery, uh, indecision doji that kind of did something like this. No, we're firmly underneath 2050. All right. <clears throat> Next up is the VIX. What's going on in the volatility of the volatility index. I would just mention that this is perking up. It's still well underneath that sort of floor and respectable level around 103, but market conditions appear to be getting back to normal, right? Some people are hedging uh, properly, right? With spy puts, VIX calls, whatever. And this is slightly picking back up to the upside, but it's not it's still not in a state where we're like, okay, things are fine back to normal. So just be mindful that, you know, as this continues to drift higher, that would indicate more quote unquote normal market conditions. If this just stays down under here, again, be prepared for, you know, if something does come out of the blue, then, you know, maybe the breakdown will be a little bit more aggressive than we anticipate. This is not something that we position early for. It's just something to keep in the back of our minds because this is indicating that, again, no one is hedged properly. Anyways, let's see what's going on from our SPY levels perspective. So weekly expected move. We're approaching the top end of the range here. Obviously, being towards the top is a more bullish than bearish implication, but it means that the risk reward is no longer as favorable as compared to the downside, right? Um, so I, I 
I should say, it's not as favorable as when we're trading in the lower portion of the weekly expected move. That's a way better way of wording it. We do technically have a gap on the chart in front of us. I do not have it highlighted in yellow because we have many other levels to be paying attention to here. I think that we're in store for some more bullish lift based on everything we've seen in the sectors. The fact that the sellers, again, could not close the gap on the day's session. If we continue over the prior day's high, yeah, top of the weekly expected move is 422.36, but the next major level that we're targeting is really these sets of highs here around 428.65. So if the XLY picks up and breaks out of that balance area, if the XLC continues higher, and if the um, XLV healthcare can break out of its range, I imagine that the S&P is in store for something like this. If those sectors in particular, so the XLY, the XLK, and the XLV, there we go. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Instead of XLK, XLC. That's what I meant to say. Uh, if those sectors in particular can move higher, then again, I think it pulls the weight of the S&P 500 uh, to, the, to that next target ultimately, and it's not the end of the world that we're at uh, the top of the weekly expected move. One thing to keep in mind here is that we are exiting basically a big area of balance. This is consolidation. This is a bull flag. This is day one of the breakout, right? Think about what happened in here. Sure, we broke down day one. Look at day two and day three. Obviously, it's probably not going to be as aggressive as that to the upside. This, of course, was a big panic shock. Uh, but to me, it would just seem reasonable is what I'm getting at, that the market can see a little bit of continuation higher going from range compression to range expansion, right? That's how markets work. They move from uh, expansion to compression, back and forth, balance to excess, balance to excess. Anyways, that's the SPY daily timeframe. If we, again, move underneath today's low, the short trade is for a gap fill only to close the gap to the prior day's high, roughly 412.50. If we take a look at the hourly time frame chart, I just want to give you a couple of scenarios here. Number one is that we remain contained inside the prior day's range tomorrow, and then we break one way or another uh, for the Friday session. That's certainly a possibility. If that does happen, it sets up pretty good risk reward. You have very obvious entry points. The downside gap is sort of what you're trading for. And on the upside, probably first target, top edge of the weekly expected move, and then continuation towards that 428.65. If the market breaks down but catches itself at 415.35, again, we would have you know, reasonably been moving into the gap. There's technically a short trade there. But if you see that the market catches itself at 415.35 and reverses off of that, that is respecting the top end of the prior balance and this breakdown point from right around in there. I would be very, very cautious on the short side if we hang up at 4.15.35 and start to put in any signs of a bottoming pattern on the intraday session, okay? So that is what I wanted to make abundantly clear on this chart because again, you get a break, retest, and then potentially go. That's obviously a bullish setup. Don't be overly aggressive on the short side if we start to fill the gap, but we hang up at that 4.15.35. That's what I wanted to convey to you here on the S&P 500 chart itself. Let's take a quick peek at the market internals and see what's going on from that perspective. If you don't know about this screen, top right-hand corner tells you what this is, how to set it up, all that good stuff. Basically, we're just gonna focus on today's reads, right? Look at what happened here, well above 300 million mark, strikes me as bullish, confirming the move higher. Everything on Monday and Tuesday was really just balance, not aggressive reads on the volume. Same thing with the advanced decliner. One thing I would say is we are way over-correlated on the upside. So could there be a reasonable pullback? Could we get more digestion tomorrow? Absolutely. Something to watch out for here. This is just, you know, kind of, of how you would trade this setup ultimately. If we open up tomorrow here at the zero line and just kind of chop around, that is extremely healthy. Uh, and if we're inside this sort of balance area from the end of day, basically the entire day's range, right? So if we open here at zero in the advanced decline, if we're inside this, that is, you know, bullish digestion at its finest. We've corrected the overcorrelation. We're all good to move forward bullishly. If we open higher, and uh, so I should say, if we open way up here, and this is kind of here, watch for a pullback, right? That's kind of how you would look at that. So just be mindful of where we open the advanced decline line versus the ES. If there's any sort of divergence there, that would be your red flag that we're either still over-correlated or we're okay. So be mindful of that. We'll, of course, discuss that in the pre-market live tomorrow. So if that's confusing, uh, we'll, we'll rehash it tomorrow morning. Anyways, ticks confirming as well with a nice bullish build on today's session. Nothing overly aggressive on the Monday or Tuesday session either. I would say the ticks could have been better today, but notice that there are no really big negative slams or positive slams for that matter. So to me, again, bullish digestion of the gap higher from CPI. Let's take a quick peek at the market profile. That's on this tab over here. And another bullish takeaway for you is that the point of control did migrate higher with price throughout the day's session. And also, we are firmly 
outside of the balance area, right? So the point of control is well outside of this area that we had right here. Strikes me as a bullish implication. More people are willing to do business outside of the balance area now, as opposed to trying to fade it back within. And we've already discussed what that means from the sellers, right? The sellers do appear to be weak here at this point in time. So that's been the S&P 500. Let's get back on over to the platform, round out the broad market, get through the core list. And then I've got four trade ideas for you. So in the QQQ, very similar psychology. The one difference is that we're sitting right at the resistance trend line. This is not something that we had for the weekly watch list video. If I just grab the yearly, we should be able to see this. Where am I going? Here we are. <clears throat> so there's our primary, right? We haven't, that's obviously very, very far away, but the secondary is right here and we're running into it right now as we speak. So with CPI, again, I would say that the sellers appear to be weak, partial gap fill, close back at the highs, close outside of this prior area of consolidation, right? So the sell, uh, sellers appear to be weak, buyers do appear to be strong. I would imagine that this could be the break ultimately of the resistance trend line. We've got a higher low pullback and now we're breaking it on good fundamental news as well, just to act as a catalyst. It looks good from a setup perspective to move higher and not just get stuffed by the resistance trend line. Just like we talked about in the S and P 500. Be mindful of the prior day's low. If we move through that, yes, there's some sort of gap fill to be had there. This is where I would look for the short more so than the S and P 500, because this is just concentrated tech, right? If uh, the S and P 500 gets a little bit of love in the XLY or the communication sector, or even financials and healthcare, it's going to hold up, right? But if the QQQ and the tech sector, so the XLK doesn't get that love, then this can easily fill the gap. And the other difference, obviously, is that we're, you know, if we, if we start breaking down underneath the low, I should say, we're underneath the top end of that balance. It won't be a break and retest like what we just saw in the S&P 500, right? So that's the main difference here. Mindful of the gap underneath. It doesn't make us bearish. It just means that there might be a short-term short trade to be had to that area when and if we get there, look for the gap fill reversal. Ultimately, anything that consolidates up around in this area strikes me as healthy digestion, bull flag in play. Over time, break that resistance trend line and move on up to the next area of resistance, which as we can see is the breakdown point from here, 337.50. So bullish implications based on psychology, based on structure as well, but the prior low of day will be your critical watch here in the QQQ. Next up, we've got IWM Russell 2000 and the small caps. What's going on in small cap land? Taking a quick peek here. This has been the relative strength monster for quite some time. Notice that this trend is far stronger than what we've just seen um, in the S&P 500 and even the QQQ. The gap here held and we got much better continuation to the top end of the weekly expected range and towards that next resistance point around 196.50 here in the IWM. This relative strength has hopefully been, as we've been discussing on the, on the streams in the morning during these videos, something that's been keeping you out of trouble. Remember that small caps are seen as a risk on risk off investment. Usually when the market's in risk on mode, small caps outperform. When the market's in risk off mode, small caps dramatically underperform uh, and, and that's really why we use this as, again, just a risk on risk off indicator. Hopefully that answered some questions around why I always say that. Uh, but notice that this is, again, this is bullish, guys. Look at the structure here. Even if this pulls back, closes the gap, there's the possibility for a higher low off of 190.71. There's no reason to be bearish in small caps unless we breach that with a strong daily bar close underneath, and then we're gunning for this. And even that on the weekly time frame chart would not be the end of the world. Right? So the structure here is bullish for day trading implications. I think we might be maxed out on the week towards the top end of that weekly expected move. Notice that we are not coming from range compression in the IWM. This is already seen in area of volatility and expansion. So this is not an area where I would say, okay, it's all right if we breach the top edge of the weekly expected move. So hopefully that distinction has been clear here in the IWM. Next up, we've got Apple. We're moving through the core list of companies here. And then I've got those trade ideas for you. Uh, in Apple, two trend lines that I want you to start paying attention to because we are quote unquote climbing the wall of worry as people say. Um, my one concern with this is just obviously as more people get longer and longer and longer towards the top of this run instead of towards the bottom, obviously you can't catch the bottom anymore. Um, it just increases the odds of a liquidation break. So if we do start to see any aggressive pullbacks lower, keep an eye on these trend lines. If we stay above the secondary, that's as bullish as it gets. If we fail and go to the primary, it's still not the end of the world. The primary trend is intact from here to here. So those are longer term thoughts. Into the end of the week, what are we looking for? Of course, we're breaking out of a four day balance range here. We got minor, minor pullback, failure from the sellers, close up at the highs, I would look for continued upside, uh, but again, with the caveat that you need to have a stop loss in place as we're quote unquote climbing this wall of worry. You can start to see how this is turning into a V-shaped bottom. You know, as we get closer to that 100% retracement, that's where you got to be careful that uh, this is not the ideal place for new longs. A higher low pullback on the weekly and then a reattempt 
is the ideal place. Again, for day trading implications, short term, absolutely bullish, moving from this four day balance outside to the upside. So watch for continuation higher. Next up, we've got Netflix. What's going on in Netflix? Great move on today's session. Break, retest, hammer candle. We talked about it in the pre market live. Ideally, we would have opened here and then crossed it in the regular trading hour session. That would have been a quote unquote nice thing for the market to have done to us uh, as options traders. But nonetheless, we got a gap and go, zero gap fill activity on the day session, and we closed strong outside of this area. Uh, a little bit tough to trade this if you're not already in. I would want to see something that looks like this. Scrunching up the chart here. Notice that this is the large earnings cycle gap down. So higher low pullback or digestion here, then a break. You know, the sky opens right up inside of Netflix. So watch 250 as the next potential long entry inside of Netflix on continuation from this breakout of the pennant that looked something like this. Consolidation first and then a break looks good to me up and over 250 uh, just because we can have a tight stop, right? Not saying that it has to guarantee we move all the way through that gap, but the risk reward makes sense based on a stop loss. Next up, we've got Tesla. What's happening in this one? Look below and fail on a two day balance range. It was really tough to trade though. We didn't really reverse off the gap fill directly. It was much deeper than that and honestly underneath 865. So this was not a trade that I was able to take advantage of at least today. But if we go to the hourly and take a peek here, uh, notice how this is the two day balance, right? We break down from there on the Tuesday session Wednesday. Look, we just break right back down. The gap fill reversal doesn't happen when you don't respect uh, 865. It's kind of off the table for me at least. But now we've closed back inside of the two day balance. So look below and fail is on the table. If there's any intraday bullish setups to get us back towards the top end, these two resistance points here around 907, that is certainly valid for tomorrow's session or at least into the remainder of the week. Looking for that uh, completion of the trade back to the top of the range. So look below and fail on Tesla is in force. I would not be bearish on this now unless we breach. Four, or excuse me, 841.25, as noted by that pullback low, right? Next up, we've got Google. What's going on in the Goog? Certainly an inverted hammer-esque type candle on today's session. So not as convincing for upside, but again, failure from the sellers to close any bit of the gap. And now we're just kind of hanging out right at the top, literally, of this multi-week balance right here. So it's got to be bullish unless it fails back in, in which case, oops, we don't want that tool. We want uh, this here, in which case you're just looking for the gap fill trade first, right? That's the minor bearish trade, the quick scalp to the downside, and then it opens up underneath 116.35. We're not really bearish in Google unless we fail that area. Just a minor pullback here is a scalp short, but it doesn't change the fact that we're up towards the top of this pseudo bull flag and the top of the weekly range that we just had in there that looked something like this. So Google, yeah, inverted hammer, maybe some selling pressure uh, implied by that upper wick. Be mindful of your gap trade here as the short trade in Google. Next up, we've got Meta. What's going on in the metaverse? This, of course, is a big component of the XLC moving higher. Notice that it was gap, you know, very little gap fill and then reversal right back up towards the highs, taking out that prior inverted hammer high as well. Um, to me, it's got to be in the bull category right? We're outside of this range firmly now with a full day's worth of acceptance, failure from the sellers into the gap strikes me as bullish. Next target is the double top from in here around 183.75. Carry that forward as a weak level because they are back to back equal highs, um, which of course is not how the auction should properly end. And notice on the left hand side, we've got thin structure that we can retrace through quicker as opposed to slower, right? So Meta, want to see some sideways digestion and then potentially some interaction with this for the next bullish trade. I'm not saying don't take intraday scalps, but from the daily implications, nothing obvious just yet. I wouldn't even take a breakdown of the prior low of day into the gap. I would want to see a failure of the prior highs here to hold, which is at 172.50. Next up, we've got NVIDIA. What's going on in NVIDIA? Upside gap is starting to fill from the conundrum we had with their sort of release of the forecasts and estimates for the earnings and guidance. And that is going to be coming into play up and over 185.25. Gap green over red, gap fill reversal. Chart looks bullish here, to be honest with you. The trade is for the gap to fill overhead towards 186 even. Or excuse me, 186.64. My eyeballs are getting a little sideways towards the end of the video. So NVIDIA, that's your upside trade here into the remainder of the week, especially if the remainder of the broad market is uh, really holding up nicely. QQQ and SPY itself, that's a bullish trade here in NVIDIA. Anything that chops around in here, neutral. I wouldn't get bearish on NVIDIA unless it breaches 169.50 and the 50 SMA. Next up, Microsoft. What's going on in softy? Double gaps in play. Neutral here. Gap starts filling over 291 up towards 296.50. 
or underneath us under today's low of day down towards 286.93. Again, be mindful that that is just a scalp. It could produce a gap fill reversal for a higher low here on the daily time frame. And it's also only day one of a breakout of a bull flag. Remember, we talked about compression leads to expansion. Well, we've just gone through a period of compression. Let's see if we can get a little bit of expansion to the upside here. So those are the levels, really just double gap in play there. Next up, last but not least, the mini beast. We've got Amazon, certainly a double gap, eh, not really as much of a double gap. So you've got this. And then of course, this obviously is still uh, the better, eh, maybe I shouldn't even say better short trade. Uh, but to me, under, under there is the short trade, really, 137.60, right? We've talked about this before. We had a break retest, and it held so far, so there's no reason to be bearish just yet. If we breach that, okay, back to the top of the gap from here. But nonetheless, anything that consolidates here, break the three-day highs over 144.85, over the 200 SMA, all of these things, if they break, our next target overhead is this prior breakdown point at 150.25. Bullish pressure for Amazon on the upside there. We've been stuck in a little bit of a balance range right here. It does not strike me as being overextended. The upside can come sooner rather than later without really being a concern uh, for, again, some sort of chasey type feeling. So that's Amazon. Next, trade ideas. BABA making a reappearance. We took it off the list a while back, and it's making a guest appearance here. The long is up and over 93.52. We've got technically a very nuanced higher low, a failure to close lower underneath the inverted hammer uh, that happened just prior to it. So on the Tuesday session, bullish hammer candle is now in force. Again, failure, as noted by this lower wick, close at the highs. If we take out the highs of this little cluster, 93.50, we're looking for higher into this sort of range in here, which strikes me as bullish, right? 100 makes a beautiful psychological target. So watch that inside of Alibaba. Trade's kind of off the table if it just dribbles lower and does some sort of drift like this into the remainder of the week. QCOM. QCOM is up next for Qualcomm. There we go. You can see we've got a bit of a bullish pennant forming here on the daily time frame. It's not in force yet. I would really want to see a break of the resistance trend line before we start targeting the highs of that flag pattern around 156. The reason I liked it is because we have a green close over red, uh, a failure from the sellers to really materialize back down underneath 143.85. So again, I, I don't think the long is here just yet, but if we can break the trend line, that to me would, would you know maybe lead, uh, act as a leading indicator, I should say, for some sort of move to the upside towards that 156. So horribly worded on my part, but you get the gist. Patience is required here. If we can break out of this flag, it looks good. If we just sort of do something like this, you know, it technically is also a descending triangle. So patience, patience, patience in Qualcomm. Next up, we've got TGT for Target. What's going on here? Inverted hammer on the day's session. Fake breakout, right? Whoa, not sure what's up with the zoom there in Thinkorswim. I think that happened on the morning stream as well. Uh, anyways, look at the flag. There's your bull flag. Fake breakout, close back within, or very close to within at least. I think the short trade's under 169.05. Here's the hourly for you. If I just zoom in on that, it's the opening print and where we supported right into the close, right? So if we break that, look for rotation to the bottom end here on 164. That's a short setup inside of Target if the broad market is pulling back on tomorrow's session. Not interested in the short trade if, number one, the market's ripping, or if this is just playing around in that upper wick, right? There's nothing to really do there. It's got to breach that firmly, and we've got the gap closed down underneath and also into the those lows that we had outlined right in there around 164. So that's targets. Then last but certainly not least, we've got IBM, the international business machine. What's going on in this one? Again, green close over red. I am watching this level like a hawk. If we can get above that, then there's some reason to believe we move through this gap. This was a prior trade idea that we brought up during this period of consolidation with the failure from the sellers to really materialize off of this inverted hammer with the green close over red. It's back in play to the upside in my estimation over 132.80, 133. Obviously, we have this gap to be trading for, so I just wanted to offer this one up as a bit of a reminder. That's ultimately going to wrap up the video. If you enjoyed it or learned anything new today, let me know in the comment section or by giving the video a thumbs up. Don't forget that we will be live at 8.30 tomorrow morning, and I wish you all a great trading week.